Good evening, everybody. Ambassador, thank you very much for hosting us. Diplomats present and uh, academics and, of course, students. We have a representative of Lazio Innova, that is the regional agency for internationalization. And I hope that tonight we will be able to do a short presentation of something that would need maybe much longer uh, session. but as the ambassador was so kind to invite us also to have some social mingling, social event, we want to keep it short. So I invite all the, she is connected. Professor Rose Boswell, welcome. We don't see you now, but well, welcome. We Thank you. Thank you. We invited you to come over to Rome, but you couldn't make it. Sorry for that. Would have been much better to have you here with us. Anyway, next time. Well, actually, the presentation tonight will be divided in three parts. The first one has to do with the research that Professor Boswell, that is from the Mandela University in South Africa, is uh, um, launching in the Ayora, Ayora um, uh, group of states and uh, this Iora group contains 21 uh, countries, and uh, Italy is just uh, a dialogue partner of the Iora since last year. So the presentation that we will uh, ask Rose Boswell is about a project that she is conducting, and maybe possibly we could find some ed some um, companies or some institution in Italy that could collaborate in your in your research. But before we start, 
I would like to pass the floor and uh, invite Ambassador Nosipo Nauskasian Zezile. It's quite difficult to remember all together, so I have to write it down. Uh, please, if you want to take the floor. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much and a warm welcome to South Africa House uh, in Rome. And uh, for you, uh, Professor uh, Nelson Mandela, Professor Bez Boswell, Roswell, uh, I'm sorry you are not here in person, but uh, we are keeping the fires burning uh, on behalf of South Africa. Uh, just to acknowledge, um, in particular, our host, uh, Giorgio, uh, you are the host, uh, Patlomuchi. He's been working very hard uh, trying to put together a program of two weeks, isn't it? Uh, more or less, and uh, this is one of those thematic areas of uh, great significance that uh, he has managed to, put, to pull together for us uh, this evening. Uh, let me acknowledge Excellencies, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Rali and uh, other academics in attendance uh, um, and uh, lecturers in the School of Governance. I'm told that this is global governance of the University uh, of Begata, or Tovegata. Is it Tovegata? Tovegata. All right, you are welcome. Uh, and uh, I also struggle with pronunciation a little bit. Pala uh, Taliano Poco Poco. Well, just to introduce South Africa in brief, and I'm not going to be long. Um, South Africa is a country uh, of a surface area of about 1.2 million uh, square kilometers located uh, in the southern hemisphere um, within a coastline uh, of about 3,000 kilometers. So if, if you've never been to South Africa, just have this imagination. It's one of those bigger countries in the top 20s, so 28th uh, in the world. And uh, we also have special uh, areas uh, of uh, islands, uh, we have Prince Edward Island, uh, the Antarctica Ocean, and our coast extends mostly both to the Atlantic on the west, which is cold, uh, which links to the Benguela Current. If you've learned something about marine science, you might know. And uh, on the far east, uh, which is part of the Indian Ocean, uh, partly what makes us to be a member of IORA, and I will also just in summary uh, talk to that. Um, so we have a vast territory, and uh, people think that we have more land than sea. Uh, South Africa has got, uh, uh, in terms of the UN law of the sea, there is a process for expanding or claiming other parts of the territory. Uh, which are more on the island and on the ocean side. And that would make us to be almost over 1.5 million square kilometers and would be more sea than land. So currently we believe that we have le more land than sea, but actually uh, this is the same phenomenon that in the UN report, if I recall, um, of uh, 2015, uh, which outlines that the world uh, is almost 60, 70% water or ocean. Um, therefore, we are a world uh, in an ocean, actually, more than what uh, we see um, as, as the land. Um, so as a nation within a continent of Africa, uh, we appreciate and we still struggle to appreciate the linkages between the oceans and the economic activities and uh, the human survival. And part of why I was keen when uh, I was uh, also approached about this uh, session today 
uh, there are more questions that will need academics and young scientists uh, to explore, uh, especially in the context of ocean governance, because part of what we struggle with in the world as uh, le world leaders uh, is managing the territory, which is normally 12 nautical miles, but also there is an area which is the high seas, which is more no man's land. And like even in Antarctica, we have an island which we have share borders. We are close to France in one of the islands. We are very close to Norway in Antarctica. We, our base is close to um, also Germany and even uh, the UK is not as far and Russia and India. So, so we are more neighbors than we actually imagine um, in, in the context of, uh, of our marine uh, environment. And I've mentioned that we have an, an, an area of 70% of the ocean, uh, which covers the surface of the earth. 60% uh, of the world population lives near the coast, according to that same UN report, and more than three um, a, a billion people rely on the ocean for their livelihoods. So the more we have a better understanding, both on the local dynamics of the interactions between sea spaces and, and human, human lives, and the animals and plants at sea, um, including birds, uh, the better we will be in terms of managing uh, um, our planet uh, and make sure that we actually uh, 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 approach our economic prosperity in a more responsible fashion than, than we normally do. And um, the world, I understand, rely about four billion people rely on fisheries for protein, or at least 15% of animal protein that people take. And 90% uh, of the world's trade takes place in an ocean. So, so whatever we transport uh, in South Africa, we export citrus, um, and we also export fisheries, and most of that also travels by sea. So, we have more reliance uh, on the oceans than we actually imagine. And the topic of today, um, uh, very much focusing on culture and heritage and tourism, uh, it is more about also understanding what can we do more on the non conservative uses uh, of the ocean and, uh, and how we live, uh, and both in terms of our tradition in South Africa, we have traditional fishers, um, and those traditional fishers used to put crawls in the, in, the, in the marine environment, and those would be trapping fisheries from time to time, and people would only take that and not necessarily use other methods of shipping that we know today, because we have to um, uh, get a big vessel to take uh, as much of the quantities as we require in the world. So these are some of the practices that are traditional, but they have values, and those values, if we were to understand them better, uh, we would probably do best for our, for, our, for our world and the planet. And in brief also, I was asked, um, uh, but Lomu had asked me to just say something about climate change. Uh, again, um, we also, um, uh, understand that uh, in the context of the world, uh, there is a change in climate, there are climate variations, uh, the variability that is not as per normal in terms of uh, our understanding of, for example, uh, sorry, fire seasons. In South Africa, we have got ecosystems that rely on fire regimes and those would be like every 10 years or 15 years. Now we have more frequencies like five years, even seven years of fire. And, and that is also having an impact on the type of vegetation that, uh, that South Africa has in terms of its biodiversity. Similarly, in terms of droughts, um, it is a natural phenomenon to expect to have droughts, but the frequency 
and the length of time that we've had experienced droughts in South Africa uh, is, no, is in higher magnitudes than normal. And, um, and if I may also mention uh, flooding uh, being one of those extreme weather events, and recently in South Africa, uh, early last year, we had, even this year actually, early this year, we had floods in the coastline of KwaZulu-Natal and a, a loss of life was realized. And these are things that we need to understand better and plan better and make sure that we limit uh, people building in areas where we should avoid uh, putting properties. So this is something that uh, uh, again is covered scientifically in the IPCC report, which is the group of scientists that work under the Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCCC. And uh, they have already projected that we have uh, to aim not to exceed 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius, and the world is already warming. Uh, and if we actually, in Africa and South Africa, 1.5 degrees um, warm, uh, warming means uh, double that. So in essence, we are already living in a three degree world uh, in, the, in the African continent. That is possibly why it, it would explain uh, the long effects of droughts uh, that uh, we have experienced. And uh, furthermore, South Africa within that global context is amongst the carbon intensive economies. Uh, by that I mean our energy generation is very much reliant on fossil fuels, uh, we burn coal, our, plant, our power plants are coal-based power plants, and basically South Africa in terms of our global commitments has to also begin to mitigate and reduce uh, greenhouse gases and uh, make sure that uh, we have other sources and we are endowed with the sun, we have wind, and we are therefore a country that is in transition in terms of investing in renewable and clean uh, energy sources. And that also solve other problems uh, of our socioeconomic challenges of inclusion and making sure that people have access uh, to energy and we can then invest in microgrid systems and, and, and not necessarily rely on these big systems. And these are some of the uh, aspects of uh, challenges and opportunities that we have to grapple with. So I can say a long um, list of things uh, on climate, but uh, suffice to say that uh, South Africa's transition, uh, uh, we has, uh, it's been structured or conceptualized on the basis of a need to focus uh, on social risks that are associated with the transition, particularly in relation to losses in employment and livelihoods and the implications on the development agenda of our country. Uh, but again, the problem statement for South Africa is that we have almost 80,000 uh, people that are employed within uh, that uh, power generation sector. And therefore, the transition requires a, a careful management in order uh, to avoid negative impacts on those livelihoods. And in, lastly, um, I, I wanted to then mention on IORA, uh, again, uh, South Africa uh, uh, joined this grouping of uh, dynamic intergovernmental organizations that is aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and uh, uh, to pursue the sustainable development agenda within the Indian Ocean region uh, through 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners, which includes Italy, it includes France, and a few other countries that uh, I will not uh, necessarily mention today, um, because some of the presenters will probably highlight that. But uh, of importance is to understand uh, the economic cooperation between these countries that are bordering the Indian uh, Ocean. And the vision of the Indian Ocean Rim Association originated during the visit of our former president, Nelson Mandela, to India in 1995, where he said, the natural edge of the facts of history and geography should broaden itself to include the concept of an Indian Ocean Rim for socio-economic cooperation 
and other peaceful endeavors. So recent changes uh, in the international system demand that the countries of the Indian Ocean shall become a single platform. With this coast, quote then, it meant that uh, some of the leaders within uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association uh, understood the importance and the special position that we are located in uh, along the Indian Ocean, and hence this association uh, referred to as IORA. And, um, and I would like to also say that uh, currently the chair and various members, some of them are G20 member states, uh, such as India, Australia, and Australia is the one that is not necessarily within the Indian Ocean. South Africa we've chaired during 2017 and up to 2019. Currently, in this period of 2021 to 2023, the chairship is under Bangladesh. Uh, for the association or RIM association. And its focus uh, on objectives is to promote sustainable growth and balanced development of the region and its member states, to focus on those areas of economic cooperation which provide maximum opportunities for development, shared interests and mutual uh, benefits, and to promote liberalization, remove impediments and lower barriers towards a free and enhanced flow of goods and services, investment and technology within the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So these member states have made these commitments and uh, they continue to pursue various activities, foster research activities and study fields of interest to the member countries in view of uh, evolving realistic a, a programmatic actions. Um, and, and, uh, and this being then the apex body uh, of this IORA is um, a council of foreign ministers that are meeting annually. And the association has functional bodies or it has a number of working groups and almost 10 working groups which include a group on marine safety and security, a group on blue economy, a group on academic science and technology cooperation, and a core group of uh, tourism. So the discussions of today are relevant in terms of advancing the IORA agenda. And uh, this topic uh, tonight um, uh, on cultural heritage for coastal tourism and climate action in the Indian Ocean is relevant to the understanding of the impeding impacts uh, or impeding impacts of climate change on coastal livelihoods um, and even the impacts on plants, fauna and flora and, and on areas of vulnerabilities and risks uh, at a local level. And because in most instances, again, I think when we talk about the, even the UN resolutions, we have to take those and implement them at a local level and have pro programmatic approaches uh, to respond appropriately. So on that note, I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers tonight and uh, uh, you are welcome and I hope you will enjoy the evening. Thank you, Excellency. You have been given us an overview, quick and very comprehensive overview of how important is the blue economy in your country, energetic transition, and of course, the coastline. Uh, in it, we have in common with Italy the longest coast, maybe we have the longer coast in uh, Europe, and you have it in Africa. And so I pass the floor uh, to Professor Rose Bo uh, Boswell, that is an anthropologist from the Mandela University in South Africa. And she's the chairwoman of this project, of this research that the Ayora Group is performing. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please inform me if you can hear me correctly. Um, Um, I'm calling all the way from Namibia, and uh, the connection here is not always perfect. Um, I did put together a PowerPoint presentation, which I have shared, um, which you can uh, read or see at your leisure 
uh, because this is a new platform that I'm working with here and I'm not entirely familiar as to how to share my particular slides. Uh, but I would like to perhaps um, begin by stating uh, that I am thankful and I'm grateful for the invitation to speak this evening um, and to be welcomed uh, by the ambassador and all the dignitaries present. Um, I'm very grateful for the possibility of sharing some of my research on issues of cultural heritage and climate change in the Indian Ocean region. It may begin with the first part of my intervention, which is I'm going to try and make it as brief and as efficient as possible to allow time for questions. Um, the small island developing states, or SIDS as they are known, in the southwest Indian Ocean region, an area that is con of concern to the Iora team, is vulnerable to the effects of climate change. and in engagements with marine specialists, um, scientists that I have worked with in the last five years, such as Professor Mike Roberts, um, the National Research Foundation Chair of Food Security, uh, Professor Lisa Levin, um, global marine biologist, and also Martin Visbeck from GeoMar. I have um, encountered the very difficult questions that certain parts of the globe specifically the Southwest Indian Ocean region and specifically also the South African uh, coastal landscape. Um, these areas are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And while we have substantive uh, documentation on the potential impacts of such climate changes on marine and flora, as well as to a certain extent on coastal livelihoods, I think require more attention is the impact on cultural uh, heritage and cultural practice uh, in the Southwest Indian Ocean. So um, we are not seeing attention being devoted to these particular subjects. And if we consider that the region of the Southwest Indian Ocean region and also the South African coastline is quite dependent on uh, tourism, for its income and that there are coastal entrepreneurs in these regions, um, a plan basically needs to be made to support such communities which are exceedingly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In 2022, uh, from March of 2022 this year up to September of this, of this particular year, my small research team and I from Nelson Mandela University based in South Africa conducted field research from Port Nollis in the Northern Cape uh, province of the country on the Atlantic side of South Africa, the Atlantic coast side of South Africa, all the way through past the West Coast, the South Coast of the country, past evocative places which have exceeding natural beauty and assets such as known as Titsikama, all the way through to the Eastern Cape province uh, and the small town of Tsinsa on the Eastern Cape. And what we found was an extraordinary uh, um, amount of interest in coastal entrepreneurship, that we had local communities that wanted to be supported, that had phenomenal ideas um, to generate uh, economic uh, empowerment, to generate economic income. Um, and some of these projects were also nascent coastal tourism projects. Um, and these revealed a, a potential um, for the stabilization of the social and uh, setting of South Africa, as well as the economic setting of South Africa, and also for future protection against the vagaries of climate change. The research which I have been conducting as a national research foundation chair in ocean cultures and heritage based in South Africa has also taken me to Kenya and of course, prior to my appointment as a research chair, I conducted field research in the Seychelles, in Mauritius, Madagascar and Seychelles. So I'm very much aware of the coastal communities in these settings. But to return back to the findings from South Africa and Kenya, 
we encountered many uh, indigenous women, indigenous peoples, first peoples, first nation peoples who would have, uh, who would be protected under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and also under the World Heritage Convention, that these communities and were looking for support for coastal tourism and entrepreneurship. And in pitching this particular project to the Iora team, I indicated that um, in my field research, along with my team, I had encountered many small uh, groups, indigenous groups, women's groups, vulnerable people's groups that had um, ideas for coastal tourism. For example, in Kenya, in a small village uh, of Kipungani uh, in, on Lamu Island, which is one of the archipelagos of Kenya, we came across women involved in honey production, but these women were in need of great support for training, for the marketing of their products, and for the sharing of their information on a larger global platform. And in conducting this research and understanding that science must be not only for academics, but that science is also for society, we felt that it was absolutely important to look for ways in which to support uh, groups of women, vulnerable groups of women that we have encountered in our field research in South Africa and also in uh, Kenya. And so what we proposed was that uh, through this project that we are putting to Iora, that we would address uh, uh, this particular, uh, these particular lack or gaps in entrepreneurial support, that we would help these uh, women groups um, and also the coastal groups to promote their project on, on virtual platforms by providing web-based applications that can achieve that end that we would document uh, via film um, and through our academic writing and through news articles to promote the endeavors of such groups to a broader, uh, a broader audience. One of the reasons why I strongly feel that it is important to share this kind of knowledge uh, beyond the nations concerned is that um, we have a great deal of poverty in Southern Africa um, and there is a historical legacy, which we're also dealing with, a historical legacy of inequality. And so I strongly feel as a National Research Foundation chair and as a uh, research leader and also as a member of society, that it is extraordinarily important that we make um, science of service to society, which is the core motto of Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, our global uh, icon and leader, the patron, if you would like to say it that way, of the university where I'm situated. Um, thus far, I've engaged with partners at the University of Seychelles, which is also an IORA member. Um, and I have a colleague there uh, by the name of Dr. Penda Chopi, and we are exploring similar possibilities for coastal tourism and cultural heritage uh, uh, empowerment in communities. We both strongly feel that cultural heritage um, forms part of the legacy that we pass on from one generation to the next, that cultural uh, heritage is an empowering aspect because without it, we uh, do not have a true sense of our identity and uh, we are not perhaps then able to contribute in a positive way to the making of, a, uh, of our society. So we feel that the um, research should have um, these components that we should be supporting coastal entrepreneurship, that we should be attending to this very pernicious and difficult issue, which our honorable ambassador has already explained in great detail, the impacts of, of climate change on coastal communities. And at the same time, we should seek to support such uh, communities because while there are plans being made to attend to dwindling fish stocks and the loss of marine biodiversity, we know from the Convention on Biodiversity, which was implemented back in 1992 in Rio, that cultural and biodiversity go together, that people use their cultural riches in order to advance uh, social and economic growth. I hope that um, in hearing about this project, and if you would like to take time to listen to my recorded presentation shared uh, with the organizers, um, that you um, will uh, be interested in potentially uh, supporting this project um, because it has impacts uh, beyond uh, the core countries which, um, in which I'm personally doing research. So just, 
just um, the country's, uh, the geographic focus of the research project is South Africa, um, Kenya, which is also a partner country of ours given its coastal location, the Seychelles, and also Mauritius as a test case study because they have um, in many ways uh, sought to use uh, the tourism industry in order for socioeconomic growth. And this is also an area where I did my formative PhD and postdoctoral work. And so we're going to look at lessons from that space and use it to, um, to project that uh, into the, the partner countries where we wish to conduct this field research. So thank you once more, uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador and all dignitaries president, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. As I said, I'm coming to you from Namibia, which is that is in itself experiencing the impacts of climate change. Uh, in the city of Vintuk, where I'm currently situated this evening, we are busy conducting field research on cultural heritage issues across the country um, as part of the NRF or the National Research Foundation project. Um, we are already seeing that there are signs everywhere. There is a severe drought even in Vintuk, a place that already has water scarcity issues, climate change issues. So we can see that these problems or these challenges are very real and that we can use indigenous forms of knowledge. We can support local communities to give them the tools that they need in order to address some of the challenges that are potentially coming to us as part of the climate change um, process. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Boswell. We will share your presentation with the academics and with the people that will request it. We have it in, uh, in the computer. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to give you, I hope you can uh, remain on, uh, online, we can give you some uh, type of, um, some type of uh, um, elements of what Italy could provide in terms of collaboration uh, with your uh, group and uh, maybe in other projects, in this project. And I will start with uh, Paolo Rosati, that is Department of History, Culture and Religion from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, asking Professor Rosati to stay within five minutes, if it's possible. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. I am Paolo Rosati, I am a research fellow at Sapienza University of Rome. I'm specialized in digital uh, humanities and cartography. And I am here in representation of the Interdepartmental Center of Research, DigiLabs Sapienza uh, of Rome, of course. I wish show rapidly uh, what we did or what we can do for the issue cultural heritage for coastal tourism and a climate action, in particular in the Indian Ocean region. The DigiLab, uh, Center, um, the DigiLab Center was founded by Sapienza uh, of Rome in 2012 uh, as a research and service center. Since August 2017, it has been an, an uh, interdepartmental research center bringing together 14 departments. You can see the uh, list of all the departments we uh, lead off. Um, more than 100 researchers from, uh, from uh, Sapienza University take part in DigiLab activities in collaboration with companies, business networks, NGOs, industrial association, state institution, local authorities and foundations. Okay, this is the other one. The center missions is uh, to strengthen interdisciplinary scientific research in the area of cultural heritage and cultural production and to manage particularly complex equipment and laboratories in the field of digital humanities, to communicate and enhance tourism and cultural heritage, to design high-tech cultural settings and practices for museums and local communities, 
and we are able to offer specialization and lifelong learning courses. In the uh, 2021 and 2022, we are studying and collecting best practices in Italy and Europe to define what uh, sustainable tourism is. This research is, develop, uh, is developing in a, a, mo a model made by some scalable solutions useful for spreading sustainable and respectful tourism best practices adopted in European, the European countries as a green itineraries uh, with a bike and e and bike for accessibility, blue economy tourism in sea and flavial sustainable tourism uh, principles, and fast internet connection and green energy, diffuse museum and hotels, fab labs uh, contamination labs, heritage research centers, classrooms, basically on uh, web economy, languages, technologies, digital humanities, digital manufacturing, and the creation of community cooperatives to manage local projects. Recently, uh, we applied the model in some Italian, of course, in the uh, PNRR uh, line, and European grants. And we have been uh, well received by uh, the local communities and municipalities. Uh, we have addressed a lot of, uh, uh, of them, and we received a very, very well being. Uh, internationally, our model was well received by the countries and the University of the Euro-Mediterranean Euro neighborhood like Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia and Morocco. And now I want to show to you uh, what uh, we can uh, do. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> An excellent study uh, we made with our partners uh, to empower the model, uh, I said before, uh, with uh, using uh, intelligen artificial intelligence and big data. And uh, the Hermes system will be able to combine numerous variables uh, to propose customized itineraries to, to visitors, targeted uh, in intervention strategy to economic operators, public administrations, uh, and, uh, for, uh, and elaborate a, sustain a sustainable and innovative growth solution for the, the territory. Uh, but, uh, but what I want to show to you is this uh, particular project, uh, which is, um, I know that uh, before uh, sustainable tourism can be planned in a large part of the world, all necessary measures must be taken to increase, firstly, well-being, economic and social stability and growth for local population. And in this case, we have welcomed some Italian NGOs, um, like Una Quantum and Wikimedia Italia, in the Map for Future project, uh, which I hope I can have another minute to explain. <laughs> um, we uh, teach to uh, a group of young people from Somaliland, in the northern Somalia, uh, living in the city of Dergesia, the instruments to map and survey their city. So uh, it started here in Rome, in our university, in, in the University of Sapienza, and today the Somali group has founded a new NGO called OpenStreetMap Somaliland, and they are working on mapping the city of Argesia. A throat field survey. They uh, are working on mapping hospitals, schools, services, water, uh, and uh, arable files. Uh, and all this data are now uh, available and validated by a peer review uh, process by the Italian researchers and uh, are released in open data format. They are now used by NGO uh, and the uh, municipality of Argesa, and uh, we receive an international humanitarian uh, organization uh, best practice uh, model. They reach our experience in, the, in that document, 
uh, municipal renewable generation through property taxation, better information for the city, the case of Argesia. So uh, we made this experience, it, it was enchanting for us. Thank you very much for your <laughs> attention. Thank you. Thank you. The idea is that all the people that want to know more will come to you after and uh, will uh, ask you more information. Now, we have um, uh, Federa Franconi from the Council of National Council of Research of Rome, Italy, of course, and uh, I hope that uh, you will... Francocci, sorry, I, I wrote it back. Federa Francocci, sorry. And I apologize for this, and I hope that uh, you will remain in the five minutes. Yes, thank, thank you. you. So no presentation. Okay, so we will go faster. So thank you very much. I'm honored and happy to be here with you and with you all and listening and learning about many news in the, in the blue economy. So I'm from the National Research Council of Italy, that is the biggest public uh, um, of research in Italy, and in particular, I come from the uh, institute that study the uh, impact of uh, the anthropic impact, because we are dealing about the, uh, and learning about the blue economy and how every citizen in the world depends on, on, the, on the ocean research for their well-being, so directly or indirectly. But as uh, we enter in the Anthropocene area, so we are dealing with uh, the impact the humans uh, directly act on the process and the equilibrium of the earth system as a whole. So from the 50s in this century, in the last century, we impacted so much that uh, uh, we started changing all the process until the tipping points and we are very close to, to that. So the, the problem is concrete and we really need to act together and collectively uh, and uh, trying to address uh, precisely and ambitious challenges and, uh, and targets. And this all together. So uh, I will tell you very briefly uh, one story that is part of our research that we deal in collaboration with the, the 22 Mediterranean countries. So we, learn, we learned too much about shared vision shared agendas and priorities, and how much is important to cooperate and co-develop solutions, trying to address common challenges. So thanks to this experience that start, uh, well, more than 10 years ago, the European Commission launched a focused initiative on the Mediterranean basin, try to bring, bring together all the countries and work together with, and cooperate and co-design a shared agenda. Now we are a bit further on this. We agreed on the priorities that of course, as uh, the ambassador very precisely uh, described that the climate change, the pollution, and so we impact very much on the, on the ocean and, the, and water system. So we need to take the uh, hydrosphere clean and safety in order to be able to, uh, to use our resources. And just to mention that, uh, for example, the Mediterranean is just 1% of the global or ocean surface, but concentrate the 7% of the microplastic in the, in the whole area. So it, it's very important to, to cooperate all together for the same. So the, the Commission now give us other instrument to cooperate and co-develop solution that they call the missions because the challenge is too big that to reach the aim, it, yes, this seems more a mission <laughs> that, uh, that a project or an initiative. So one of the five missions that the Commission identifies is the uh, ocean and waters. So the, the hydrosphere all together to, to be safe, protect, restored, and uh, better known and valued. So the commission identified three uh, priority area. That is the 
decarbonization, the prevention of pollution and mitigation of the effect, and the biodiversity and restoration. And these are more vertical priorities. And then provide uh, the citizen with the instrument that comes to the digitalization, so the digital knowledge and the stakeholder engagement, and as transversal instrument to to face this challenge. What in practical terms? So, um, taking again as an example the Mediterranean, we are asked to specifically address the pollution because yes, the pollution is one of the biggest problem uh, here in the Med. And uh, how we face this? We create an ecosystem of innovation across all the Mediterranean area by engaging three different continents, 22 countries, all together and uh, um, bringing the innovative um, target and the innovative tools to address this challenge, for example, of converting uh, plastic waste into oil or renewable materials and uh, um, cooperating with fishermen. And now I see here uh, Fidel Pesca, that is one of our, our partners in this kind of project uh, to be very concrete on uh, specific activities and engage and co-design at the local level by, as you said before, uh, really look at the local resources, at the tradition and the, uh, at the capacity at the local level to implement solution. But as you know, the capacity are, are not always there. Even if you, if you want to use new solution, if you look at different um, sectors of innovation, for example, so how to face this? The, the project that is called the Lighthouse, for example, the, the, in which you focus on one specific priorities, so the, Medi the Mediterranean, will create a lighthouse to share the capacity among all the stakeholders. So we will test in pilot cities or regions at the local level, and then we will transfer this capacity across all the basin. So I think that this is a very good opportunity to share pra uh, good practice and to learn each other. And uh, of course, all the information are open and, uh, and uh, I'm available here to provide you with further information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Professor Francocci. And we pass now the floor to Antonella Pusce that comes from the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. Uh, she has a course in heritage education and digital technologies. Thank you, thank you. I'm really honored to be here and to have this opportunity uh, to talk uh, to you uh, tonight. Um, yes, I teach museum education at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, where I chair the Center for Research into Heritage Education and uh, Wellbeing uh, and Teaching Technologies. Um, we try to work on interdisciplinary projects um, dealing with cross-sectional skills in heritage users through criti a critical use of technology. That's our uh, main aim. Um, our uh, Center for Research is made of uh, um, international partners. Um, among those, we have the University College of London, uh, the Metropolitan Museum um, in New York, the National Gallery in Washington, uh, Columbia University, Simon Fraser University. Of course, all over Europe we have different partners, uh, different universities in Paris, in Madrid, in Barcelona, um, Bamberg University in Germany. So uh, we try to have uh, different perspectives from different subjects. So we would be very much honored if we could um, have more interaction with Africa and uh, we would like uh, uh, very much to develop different projects together. Um, so for tonight I started reflecting on how heritage landscape uh, and uh, protected areas are connected to the uh, field of education. 
Education can play a very important role. There are different documents, especially from the European, um, the European uh, Commission. Uh, but uh, let's not forget, so the, the, the education and landscape for children, for, for example, is one of the documents we refer to uh, to identify how uh, we could reinforce uh, the sense of belonging, um, the um, responsible and active citizenship building that could be developed through uh, heritage uh, education, uh, especially related to landscape. Um, uh, landscape is an essential component of the life uh, context of every population. It is the expression of the different aspects uh, of uh, um, our common heritage and is the natural um, basis for our identity construction. So there's a close relation between museum and la museum landscape um, as uh, the idea of conservation, value, and communication. Um, when um, groups are excluded from the cultural and artistic life of a territory, uh, they do not contribute actively to the creation and the sharing of a collective common uh, memory. So cultural exclusion means um, uh, social exclusion. So that's why we should work uh, for that. Uh, we have, you know, the UN 2030 agenda, especially um, connected to objective three and four, related to health and well-being and education, points out how culture um, can play a relevant uh, and um, key uh, role in the development of such uh, uh, issues in increasing the possibility for everyone to participate in uh, citizenship uh, life. Um, I always refer to the ladder of citizen participation by Einstein, and even if uh, it, it's uh, uh, dated 1969, it um, explains how uh, we could support the citizens' uh, involvement through um, control, um, partnership, participation, and cultural activities can, can be absolutely pivotal. But in, for the sake of this uh, meeting tonight, I'm not going to um, introduce you um, to the different projects we have been developing, um, many different projects in the field of cultural heritage um, at European level, um, dealing with different, uh, different kind of uh, issues, for instance, open mo mobility that could support uh, um, uh, um, landscape uh, protection and heritage uh, protection or other projects where we work with cultural heritage and technology for primary school children. Uh, the one I would like to focus on, but just for, for one minute because time is limited, is the one where we contributed to create a biodiversity observatory in the Sicily region um, working with uh, the Center for National Research um, and um, the, um, the objective, the main objective was the creation of the Observatory for Biodiversity um, um, in Sicily in um, the um, Center for uh, Marine um, Research uh, um, at the CNR. Uh, Center for National Research. Uh, there, uh, the main aim was the understanding the, that scientific, the, the knowledge of scientific phenomena um, can um, provide individuals uh, with the cognitive tools necessary to participate actively in social life and in democratic and decision-making uh, dynamics. There, we developed different workshops, so both for uh, students, uh, for, for secondary school students in the area of uh, uh, Palermo and, and uh, um, uh, Palermo and Trapani, um, where we um, worked uh, 
through scientific concepts helped by the teachers who uh, as well took uh, uh, different activities, di different training activities, and we used uh, heritage, landscape, um, of course, uh, uh, biodiversity uh, concepts, um, and um, uh, creative writing um, activities to support uh, the development of uh, their um, knowledge in the field. Um, we devised also an evaluation and assessment program that um, improved the program was very successful. So there are different ways, different uh, um, uh, evidences that certain, certain um, activities can uh, be helpful and can support our uh, development as citizens. So we are very happy to contribute if possible. Thank you. I think we are in uh, good shape in terms of time. And uh, I'll pass now the floor to Milena Marzano, that is the scientific coordinator of Global Alliance for Skills. Good afternoon, good, good evening to all of us. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, our, uh, our ambassador for hosting us in this uh, uh, amazing location. It's, uh, it's an honor for us and a pleasure. Thank you so much. So um, I will ask to start with a short video, very short, I promise, uh, about the Global Alliance for Skills, and then, then I will catch up the most important concept. Across the world, a skills-first approach using innovative technologies is helping leaders recover from the current economic crisis and navigate sustainable workforce transformations, such as the digital and green transitions. As reflected by the new industrial strategy for Europe, moving towards a low carbon economy will create more than 1 million jobs by 2030 and industrial transitions will require reskilling and upskilling for more than 120 million Europeans over the next five years. These changes require the acquisition of many new skills that allow full participation in the economic renaissance of the labour market. A green culture based on new human-centred approaches needs to be developed. The acquisition of green skills in the workplace will increase resilience and adaptability of workers, managers and stakeholders, while contributing to green growth, planetary health and societal resilience. The Global Alliance for Skills is a first of its kind shared knowledge hub, resource and meeting ground that connects leaders and solutions across the world through a shared goal of supporting transition from ordinary economies to a circular and sustainable workforce amongst their communities in alignment with the Global Sustainable Development Goals. Beginning with the European fishing and aquaculture sectors, the Global Alliance for Skills will discuss ways that workers can be connected to reskilling and upskilling opportunities that help further their knowledge, adapt and learn new skills. We will also address helping these communities adapt to the influx of new technologies. Furthermore, with the European Green Deal in mind, the Global Alliance will claim to champion conversations amongst leaders about increasing market competitiveness, innovation, and knowledge using a skills-first approach and promoting a cross-sectoral labor market intelligent analysis. Skyhive is proud to be a founding member of the Global Alliance for Skills, and we strongly urge all interested parties to apply to join the Alliance in order to utilize skills as a currency to transition to a more sustainable future. On behalf of Skyhive and Milku, we look forward to partnering with you on this mission and revolutionizing the European workforce. I believe that uh, was the, what uh, Sean Hinton from uh, Skyhive has explained in this video 
uh, clearly shows what is the vision uh, of the Global Alliance for Skills. We are um, excited today to launch the very first experience um, of this new, uh, let's say, forward-looking project. Um, the Global Alliance for Skills has uh, shares um, um, the, the objective of uh, becoming a knowledge hub where different stakeholders can be part of it and can share their vision, uh, their knowledge, but also their resources. And today we are starting with the blue economy, uh, industrial ecosystem. Um, we will have more information uh, with Mohan Reddy in, uh, in, in a while. And, but the main scope of the Global Alliance is to activate uh, 17 industrial ecosystems uh, in every country that wants to host us and uh, in any industrial ecosystem that that country believes that is important for them. Uh, for Italy, Feder Pesca uh, has chosen to be the leading partner for the blue economy. And we, we are grateful for the courage, the, the um, let's say the trust, and also the uh, enthusiasm with, uh, with, uh, with Francesca Biondo has uh, uh, let's say, built with us this important step. Um, one important thing that I want to share with the audience is that um, there is, um, we are in the right time and at the right place, not only because of the location of the uh, our ambassador, but also because this is the year of skills that is uh, starting next year. Um, was announced by the European Union, and we believe that uh, the, the, the timing with which we are approaching uh, this new perspective will bring to the table uh, a total different approach comparing to what has been done until today. What is the vision that uh, distinguishes the Global Alliance for Skills uh, from any other attempt to put together um, perspectives, these different perspectives. Um, I, I will recall the, the light motive of uh, the entire festival, which uh, says, is change uh, exactly? If it's not an option, could it be that it's not an option? Uh, what we believe is that, and what we have actually already found is that uh, it is not possible to not change, but this has to happen with a new kind of dialogue be between among all stakeholders, where somewhere and somehow there is an empathetic um, look toward the other perspective. Uh, this means that while industry uh, speaks with companies, but also with the community and with policymakers, diplomacy, uh, can have a strategic role, as in the case of the blue economy, where Feder Pesca has been uh, the middle, in the middle position between two different poles that until today uh, had difficulties to, uh, to get on the same path. Um, I will stop here. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, after me, I have Mohan Reddy from uh, SkyHive. He's CTO of SkyHive and uh, professor at Stanford University. And Mario Roccaro, project manager for EIT Food Education. As you imagine, it's difficult to summarize in 10 seconds their uh, story of, of life. Uh, but I will give them the floor sharing, uh, without their permission, a quote that came out from uh, today's conversation. We were talking about how do you see the Global Alliance for Skills? What is your uh, perspective, no? And um, Mohan said, we need to start um, sharing the vision that the smallest unit of knowledge is the skill. And Mario answered, all stakeholders should collaborate and not be in competition. This is the summary of their perspective, so please, Mohan. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, distinguished guests, good evening. And um, on behalf of SkyHive, I'd like to sincerely thank for inviting us. Um, today, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about 
you know, building the new, the workforce of tomorrow, right? And like, you know, really go, get into the details of a skill-centric world. Right? Um, in, in the next five years, 50% of our skills are gonna change. You have to unlearn everything that you have done so far because the world is changing at an unprecedented speed, right? The challenges we encounter are very different and, and you have to think differently, right? You have to think how you educate yourself. You have to think how the jobs are gonna be. You have to think how, um, you know, the, you know, the university study has to be, and you have to think about how to change policies as well, right? So um, it's, it's gonna be a whole different world. And what you will see is inversion of labor market. What do I mean by inversion of labor market? Is supply will become demand, and demand will become supply. That is, the jobs will interchange, like, you know, the people will interchange, and now it will be a whole different world, right? And so we at Sky Hive, what we do is, you know, we um, cater to, we look at the world in four-sided angle, like um, people, companies, policy makers, and educators, right? the entirety of the labor market, okay? And we break the entire labor market into this fundamental quanta unit, skill, right? And skill becomes the unit of work or the unit of knowledge, right? That is the new currency of the world. And you look at me, I'm collection of skills. Look at a job, there's a collection of skills. Look at a policy, there'll be collection of skills. Um, you look at a course in a university or a degree, that's a collection of skills. So gone are those days where you do four years courses and you learn things that are not necessary. You would be learning things that are needed for the labor market, right? That are, and you will relearn and relearn and reinvent yourself. This is how it is gonna be, like, you know, from a whole traditional view of, of how we look at it. And so we wanna build, like, the workforce that meets the business challenges, right? And this is what is there in everybody's mind, really. Um, and so how do we do that, right? So you have to really like look at labor market like nobody else has done before. So we organize the world's labor market for like, you know, in a whole different way and we invented this whole technology called quantum labor analysis. Across the world, over 242 countries, 86 different languages, we bring in data, data about people, economic data, jobs, compensation, um, policies, anything that you really think of, and we built this world's biggest labor market knowledge graph. Right? Like all of the data is organized right now, and that is the central intelligence. Right? And we developed many artificial intel intelligence algorithms on top of it uh, in order for us to understand like the real-time labor market, what is really happening. Right? And traditionally, you know, in the, in the job-based economy, a very, like, you know, this is how you have to do the course. These are the courses you have to take. Or, like, you know, there's a very static taxonomy or ontology, what people call about. What we do is, it's all dynamic. You look at real time. There's a new skill that's emerging, we would pick it up. Right? It could be in the blue economy, or it could be metaverse. It could be new cybersecurity that you're really thinking of. And all of these are happening dynamically. And the static way of looking the world changes and we pick those up. New skills, new job titles. How do you attain them? Right? What do you have to do with, with, with those is how you have to really look at the world. Right? And like, you know, we want to understand like, you know, the, the emerging skills and trends. Right? You know, which skill is going away? Which skill um, is constant, which skill I need to now learn, because this way the governments have to sustain, the policymakers have to really think about like, you know, what is it I need for, for me as a country, as a community, as a company to sustain the future that I'm really seeing. Right? And so providing that predictive insights. And, and 
making like target workforce plans, right? Like, you know, I am an individual, I am a company, I am a community, I'm a, I'm a country, I wanna go from here to the next step. So what do I need to do? What are the skills? What are the workforce plans that I have to build for the same? And that is what we, we, we use our technology for looking at. Um, I'm not gonna quote, like I'll share this, but one very important thing is with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like, you know, with all the data in the world that we are analyzing, you know, we are impacting generations to come. And that's why it is incumbent upon us to be ethical and explainable. When the machine starts making decisions, you have to be very careful because you have to have imbibe the ethics to it, right? And that's why I see so many students here, especially you guys are doing governance. I, I sincerely urge all of you to study and think of the whole ethical AI and where like, you know, the new systems are going towards. And at Skyhive, we are ethical AI by design and explainable. Like anything and everything we do has to be ethical and all the way from data, uh, algorithmic bias, elimination of algorithmic bias and, and the decisions you would make really. And so anywhere that, that is harmful, you have to remove it and, and be very careful about how these decisions are made. Um, so, we, we, using our data, we look at like all sectors and we're starting with the blue economy as Milena just said. Um, and like, you know, green skills, sustainability, like, you know, many areas that, that we would look. And here's the case study I really wanna do from our data is the blue economy by country in EU, right? As you can see, the major sectors, like, you know, different uh, Netherlands, Greece, France, Denmark, these are the top countries that we see in terms of like, you know, the blue economy and, and all like, you know, we've analyzed skills. We've analyzed the job titles, right? Like the jobs that people hold. We've seen the, the, the job postings. We have also seen how people are like functioning and all the policies in it, right? And so this is the level that we can go very, very deep into it and, and provide like, you know, and, and various sectors like aquaculture, coastal tourism, dredging, uh, marine, maritime, and shipyards and shipbuildings, right? And we can go deeper and deeper into it. Here's the top 50 blue skills, right? Like, you know, uh, as you can see, uh, we, you know, we can go deeper in, in the sense that uh, I can classify these skills. Some of them are um, soft skills, some of them are technical skills, some of them are functional, right? Like soft skills is what I was talking with Mario, like about leadership, about learning, like how could you do that? Or I can get to the, the more technical, like engineering skills. So you can really layer it and, and, and look at these skills. But one thing that is very important is, most of these skills are transferable. That is from one sector you can take to the other sector, right? And that's the most important part is traditionally people would only see what 13 skills. But with the methodology we've developed, we can see an average 34 skills people have. Now imagine from 13 to 34, that opens up a whole new ground of whole new opportunities and, and career paths for, for people really. Um, and these are the, the titles um, and uh, these are the major sectors. So um, I will pause here. I've, I've zipped through many, many things. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And yes, and I don't know if you have time for questions, but like, you know, Thank you very much uh, for indulging with me. Thank you very much, Professor Reddy. Mario Roccaro, Program Manager Education, AET Food. Yes, uh, good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for inviting us. Uh, this year has been the, the year of youth, and I'm really pleased to see so many young people tonight delight uh, you have gone through a very tough time. Uh, the, the pandemic has affected you enormously, not only you, but also you. But next year has been announced by uh, Milena, it's gonna be 
uh, the year of, of, of the skills for the European Commission, for the European Union. Perfect timing uh, uh, tonight talking about skills. And uh, let's, let's go, uh, EIT, European Institute of Innovation and Technology. That's what EIT stands for. And I work for the uh, food sector. Okay, so there's been a lot of, uh, uh, of course, the aquaculture is part of it. Uh, I will not talk specifically about aquaculture, I will talk about skills. And I will talk about what we have tried to do, actually before we meet SkyHive, now we have SkyHive, about our learning service. Because at some point young people need to be, uh, to understand w what type of, 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 uh, of courses uh, uh, they want to take, but also, uh, employers need to understand what type of uh, upskilling and reskillings uh, their employees need. And if uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I would like to somehow uh, set the scene. Uh, please go to the next with a short video and then I come back to you. The way we produce and consume food has many challenges that urgently need to be solved. But we have far too few bright minds with all the right skill sets to lead and support the transformation from farm to fork. We need many more across all sectors to create solutions to transition to a net zero food system, enable healthier lives through food, and achieve a fully transparent, resilient and fair food supply. Yet more than 40 million people work in the European food system, from agriculture, manufacturing, retail, across to Horeca. So what is the problem? Most of them have skills shortages and are not equipped to deal with the challenges ahead. The vast majority work in small or medium-sized organizations where innovation is not a key priority. The required skills are also set to change, where qualification levels are going up, but there is no traditional education culture and no recognized evidence of additional gained skills. Nothing that would be visible on a CV. We spoke with over a thousand companies, employers and partners across our network in Europe to find out how they felt firsthand. Employers say they see a lack of international continuity in non-academic training, even though the food system is global and competencies really need to be transferable. HR managers feel unable to integrate professional standards into their HR practices, particularly around innovation competencies, and they're unable to use self-scans or HR scans for employees. Line managers find it hard to provide suitable staff development and role profiling based on employer needs. Organizations have nothing to evidence the caliber of their workforce, even if they do undertake training. Individuals believe there is nothing to evidence their advancement and training providers have no way to show professional recognition and they find it hard to prove their added value. The message was clear. Change is needed in order to professionalize education and to drive innovation across all parts of the food system. We've looked at developing solutions that meet the needs of industry and individuals. Our education and training provision will be at the forefront of these changes, setting a pan-European professional standard and a clear mark of excellence. Of course, a little bit of marketing here, but uh, actually that's why we are engaged with this type of uh, activity and we have come up uh, with uh, a solution. And this solution uh, it's basically here. So these five, four parts here try to address uh, a number of issues that have been already said. On one side, we have developed a competence framework. This is very, very important because allows 
uh, people to orient when you are looking for something in order to upskill or reskill uh, your, your CV, your curricula. Uh, also, we have developed a certification. This is uh, absolutely not a, a trivial thing because if you move from one country to another or if you are in the same country, you need to show evidence of what are your learning outcomes. And this is something that needs to be measurable and need to be accessible to any person which see uh, your CV. And then finally, uh, we have we have uh, uh, we act as an integrator, and you will see in a minute. And we have developed a number of services, and um, uh, this is basically our ecosystem. This is basically what, we, what Milena was saying. We have to bring everyone inside uh, the, the the game in order to achieve as much as possible. And this is our uh, pan-European skill platform to drive food system transformation and transformation or transition has been a word used several times this evening. We are in a transition and we need to have the skill to be able to achieve this transition. Now, uh, everything that we try to do, of course, follow this 3R uh, philosophy. Uh, so we want to give a, a robust uh, uh, type of uh, uh, pathway uh, relevant for, for what the challenges of the society of a, a sector are, but also recognized with a certification, of course. And this is our uh, uh, competency framework. What you see here are two things which have been uh, uh, basically discussed already uh, by uh, Mohan on one side on this side these are the technical skills these are the skills which uh, you need to have anyway uh, in, in any sector these are now for the food sector and these are relevant but on the other side here on the right hand side this is what we call underpinning capabilities these are the capabilities which allows you to uh, find solution to a problem which allows you to critically think about something. And this is also the skills which allows you to become an entrepreneur. So to have those skills is fundamental in order to drive innovation and transition of the agri food system. And uh, what happened here is that when you have a course, then we, uh, we are able, when we design a course, we make and give you uh, some specific uh, uh, um, uh, competencies of this framework, but we can also basically highlight uh, the fact that there are sort of beginners and then there is a, a very expert type of uh, learning outcomes. They are fundamental in order you want to show what you are able to do uh, at the, at the level when, when, you, when you go for, a, for, a, for an interview or for a job. And uh, uh, this is, uh, yes, I'm almost done. This is uh, basically this integration that I was telling you. So we have basically, we start with competence framework. There is a role profiling, what you really need, where you stand in this framework. And then through skill intelligence, through the help of SkyHive, we can then start to see what are the emerging uh, or the gaps existing in the, in the landscape of, uh, of job uh, in order to design course introduce this course in a course design avail available for everyone and finally to lead to a certification. And that's done. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have met Arthur Pasquale. Is he here? Arthur Pasquale from ISPRA? Well, he's not here. So we pass to Francesca Biondo that is, has been named several times. She is the director of Feder Pesca, and uh, she has been uh, very busy today. We had another event on, f on uh, blue economy and sea sustainability, so you must be tired. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Giorgio. We are very proud to be partner of the Diplomacy Festival. Thank you very much for hosting us in this beautiful place. I would like only to take two minutes to, to say something about what Milena, Moan, and Mario has explained to us, because we are very proud as Feder Pesca to be part of this adventure. And uh, I think that in the, in the framework of such a significant and international event as the Diplomacy Festival, uh, Feder Pesca is proud to lead 
the alliance, the global alliance for for skills, together with SkyIve and Milcop, and also to having sponsored this successful meeting. So thank you very much. And starting from the European fisheries and aquaculture sector, Feder Pesca is committed to pursue two priorities as part of the Global Alliance for Skills. The first priority regards the discussion on the best strategies to promote and empower a new self-sustainable green and blue economy, as you, as you told before. And the sec secondly, Feder Pesca is dedicated to share best practices around workforce transformation in the fishery and aquaculture ecosystem through the implementation, as you, as you saw, of reskilling and upskilling pathways. Reskilling and upskilling are indeed fundamental to deepen knowledge and learn new skills, including technological ones for fishers, fishing enterprises, and the workforce in the value chain to be able to adapt to a changing world advancing towards a digital energy and ecological transition. The digitization of business and roles risk inevitably make many jobs obsolete. And so this is also for the fishery sector. This is why Feder Pesca believe very much in this project. And we, along with SkyEye, of course, are committed to ensuring that aquaculture and fisheries, which are two of Europe's most important agri-food sectors, have the resources they need to reskill their workforces, create new roles, and successfully convert traditional industry standards. So thank you very much to all of you for your participation, both here in the residence and also in uh, online. And it has been a, a, real, a real pleasure and I look forward to continuing working together for a more resilient fishery and aquaculture workforce and community. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> What Francesca didn't say that uh, Feder Pesca has drafted the master plan for fisheries and aquaculture of Somalia. So they will another evening. Another evening, another evening <laughs> yes. And also that next Friday in the morning in uh, in Confitarma Federazione del Mare will be a session dedicated to fisheries and European standards. We know that many countries that are not EU have difficulties in uh, achieving a standard and uh, being able to export their fisheries. So this is a support that we want to provide to countries in order to give them the possibility to transfer it, to transmit to their countries at least some information about the new regulations that are going to be put in, uh, um, in, in operation in the next months and that will make much more difficult the life of the fishermen outside Europe to import, to export to Italy or to Europe anyway. So I think we have uh, uh, closed. We say in Italy and uh, before somebody came to me and said how long does it take? Because we ask always to have the pasta very raw. And so they asked me, when are we going to throw the pasta? So I said, it's about 8.20, now it's 8.18. So I think that that was a good uh, forecasting for me. And uh, Ambassador, if you want to close, just a few seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That was, uh, I think all speakers uh, gave us uh, a homework and food for thought. And I would hope that uh, we are going to have another opportunity where we can, we will converse uh, during uh, the eats. And uh, I want to say buon appetito. Yeah. Grazie. <laughs> Please.
Ah, ah, si sente? Adesso si Adri, no, Adri, no, Milano, no, 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 no,